What's up guys, this is Characters and welcome back to the Carrot Podcast episode number 23. I actually checked this time so I could tell you guys which episode it was so I could come across a little bit more professional than usual, which I think is always a good thing when you're trying to promote yourself as a teacher of poker. So today we're going to continue along the same vein as before and we're going to move on to the next chapter, chapter 3, um, or actually chapter 4 I think, but the third actual technical chapter, chapter 1 of my book is pretty much just an intro into lots of central poker concepts that aren't really too technically specific. They're more just things that you want to have in place. Um, You want to understand about the game before you seriously embark on pursuing a career in poker or a serious hobby in poker. But anyway, so chapter four, as it were, in the book is all about sea betting. And this is one of the first, this is like the first part of called post-flop. So if opening ranges are where you start pre-flop, then sea betting is definitely where you start post-flop because the most common situation you can find yourself in post-flop by about a million miles if you are a solid regular is c-betting the flop as a pre-flop raiser and that's because any solid reg plays many more hands as the aggressor than he plays as the passive caller into the pot in almost all games online six max cash games this is very different in like full ring live cash or something like that where a lot of people limp and you see a lot of multi-way pots and you should play more passively pre-flop but in online six max cash it's all about stealing it's all about you know, feeding that red line, picking up blinds, it's all about just making the most of any fold equity you have, basically, pre-flop. And so, because of that, you will end up being the guy with the initiative, being the aggressor on the flop way more often than you will be the defender on the flop, as I'm going to call it. So I'm going to refer to these two roles as the aggressor and the defender, and we're going to get to talking about how to defend the flop in later on, later podcast episodes when we move through to a later part of the book. Um book is still coming coming along, kind of like life disruptions going on a little bit, but hoping to get it done um, for you guys in the next couple of months, so it will be out and available on Amazon for you to download in a kind of Kindle online format. So fingers crossed I can do that as soon as possible, but until then, hopefully this these podcasts can keep you um, sort of entertained and give you a flavour for what's to come in the next couple of months when it comes out. So sea betting the flop. Um, this is really important and if you have a big leak in sea betting it will actually completely negate any win rate that you're likely to have in your game because you play the spot over and over again and moreover this is a spot where the pot has been raised so there's a bit more money at stake. When you risk a sea bet you're typically risking more money than you would risk by like opening the blinds or what, opening the pot or whatever. In general not always going to be the case you can see bet quite small in a lot of situations and we'll, we'll deal with sea bet sizing um, in the next episode. This is going to be a two-part of this chapter. I'm going to first start off with the factors today that actually make a sea bet good or bad, and just to clarify what I mean by a c-bet, I'm going to be using the term light c-bet um, in this chapter, and that is the kind of c-bet I'll be referring to. So what a light c-bet is, is a c-bet that's not made for value. A light c-bet is one that could be made with or without equity, so your hand could be able to improve. You could have a straight draw, a gut shot, two over cards, an under pair, middle pair. The point is that whether or not you have showdown value and whether or not you have equity, you don't have a value hand that you're going to be betting for multiple streets to build the pot nice and big to extract value from your opponent. So there's definitely a cap on the made hand strength that you can have when you make a light c-bet. We will talk about value c-betting when we come to the chapter on value betting, um, but for now we're just going to leave that completely and talk about light c-betting, which is the most common type of c-betting you'll do in no limit hold'em because most hands miss most flops as they say which is completely true it's one of those things that's just like a complete tautology it's just a total fact about no limit hold'em um it's not a tautology because it's not necessarily true i'm going to not go into like philosophical tangents though because that's just like as tempting as it is it's not what you guys want to hear probably unless you want to talk philosophy email me at admin at carrotcorner.com and we can definitely do that because i never turned down a good philosophical discussion anyways so the first factor we're going to think about when we're light sea betting and that flop comes down and we've missed it mostly and we've not we've not flopped a very good hand we've not flopped something we can value bet and um, maybe we've flopped the draw maybe we haven't but the first thing we're going to think about is the board texture and this kind of goes without saying it's probably the first one my students will tell me when i do that first or second lesson with them where we cover sea betting if necessary I'll say, what do you think of the factors that make a good light C-bet? And usually they'll come out with board texture. Then I'll say, okay, elaborate on that. What kind of textures can you get? So in my book, I separate textures into a few different categories. I start off with type 1 bone dry textures, which is like king 7 deuce rainbow, 7 7 3 rainbow. Um, These flops are very hard to connect with, and the disconnected shape and lack of draws makes it difficult to frequently flop anything better than one pair. Because of this, these bone dry flops yield a lot of fold equity for the simple reason that 
your opponent is just not going to have very many um, plus EV avenues to play back at you. His range is at severe disadvantage on these flops to yours because yours is uncapped and on King 7 Deuce you can have like Ace King and King Queen whereas an Aces whereas he probably can in Pocket Kings and on 773 you can have a whole host of over pairs, tens or jacks or queens plus depending on which ones um, he can have in his range, you can have in your range but he can't. So bone dry flops are typically going to make very good C bets most of the time unless the other factors are very much against us. Type 2 would be a dry flop, something a little bit more connected but certainly not very connected. Something like Queen 9 4 Rainbow or 7 6 2 Rainbow. These flops offer more opportunities to flop a pair and also more opportunities to flop some kind of straight draw like open end or a gut shot or back to a flush draw, I guess, has the same potential as the ones above. There are no flush draws available on these textures. They're still rainbow boards, but they're a little bit wetter and they do offer still great C bet, I think, opportunities normally for a light C bet, but we do need to be a bit more careful if the other factors are like really against us you know there could be a spot where you'd want to see bet a bone dry board with your whole range or something and I, th I might even split this into three parts and talk about how to expand sea betting and talk about our range instead of just our hand we probably will do that in fact because there's so much to talk about in this topic so expect three episodes on this actually so yeah these dry flops there could be a spot where you want to see bet a bone dry flop but not a dry flop because the other factors are really close but the vast majority of times that you're going to want to see bet a bone dry flop like king seven deuce rainbow you're also going to want to see bet a dry flop like seven six deuce rainbow semi wet boards type three are things like jack eight six um two tone or ace queen three two tone two tone meaning two of the only two suits or colors available on the flop meaning there is a flush draw possible because there's two of one suit necessarily um so these flops offer more more in the way of straight draws flush draws pairs like the ace queen three two tone board this has two big cards that people are likely to play instead of just one on the queen nine four rainbow flop there's also these flush draws and more gut shots and more likely gut shots when there's two big cards out the gutters that your opponent's going to flop there will be more common because people play jack 10 and king 10 and king jack more than they play things like in 10 8 and um yeah stuff like that so basically these semi-wet boards are still going to be sea bettable in some cases, or in many cases, but they're going to depend on the other factors being more favourable. It's always just one piece of the puzzle board texture. It's a very large piece when it comes to sea betting, but it's far from the full story. There's a lot of other stuff that we need to think about as well before we just go ahead and blindly sea bet these flops. The semi-wet boards are going to be sea bet a good bit less frequently than the type 1 bone dry boards. They're going to require a lot more things in our favour that we'll get to shortly. Type 4 would be a wet board, something like King Jack 9 2 tone or 9 8 6 2 tone. It's very easy to connect in some way with these flops and very possible to connect in a big way as well. Um, so, yeah, the pattern by now should be clear. We need more favorability than other factors in order to see bet on textures that are wetter. And, you know, King Jack 9 is quite obviously wetter because it offers a lot more draws, pairs, two pairs pair plus draw, there's just a lot of ways you can connect with that. Some people fall into the kind of trap of thinking that wetness depends solely on how many flush draws are possible, when there's just so much more to a board texture than that. There's, they neglect oftentimes just that being able to flop more pairs can make a board extremely wet and can mean that your opponent's just very likely to have connected with that flop. Like a, a flop like Ace King Jack Rainbow doesn't have any flush draws, but it's still a pretty damn wet board in most situations. Wetness can also depend on your opponent's range as well. So these very wet, these wet boards like 986 2-tone, King Jack 9 2-tone, they're going to need a lot more of the other factors basically. You're getting to the point now where there are, you're going to want a considerable checking range whenever your range is not super strong on these boards. And the wetter the board is, um, the more the, the more level the playing field is going to be in terms of who has a range advantage. Because on a really, really wet board, on a really dry board, the big hands are literally like the over pairs, the top set, the top pair, top kicker. And as the preflop raiser, you have more of these hands than your opponent does, and you have a significant range advantage there. On a wet board like 986, two tone, the big hands here are things like a set, basically, or a combo draw. And your opponent can have jack 10 of hearts or pocket nines as easily as you can. And a lot of these situations, these are not hands he's so likely to three bet. And so range advantage is more neutral. And so your ability to start blasting away at the pot to take it down and elicit full equity is just not as not as um as as less basically. You're just not gonna be able to do that so easily when your opponent has as many good hands as you have. And the, moreover, their range is more defensible because they can have these big hands in their range that are actually the nuts. They can go ahead and raise the flop with a higher frequency because they have more combos of the nuts relative to the rest of their range than they do on a bone dry board.
a soaking flop type 5 would be like queen jack 10 two tone jack 9 7 monotone this kind of thing these boards are just they're very easy to connect with especially if you're multi-way you're going to need to be more careful you're going to need to have more equity um, which is the next factor we're actually going to get onto in terms of c-betting as well as the later factors in your favor as well so board texture is a very influential factor um, but it's not the full story and there are many times when um, you know you can see bet the type 1 textures with like anything at all but as you move through to like the type 3 or type 4 boards that are wetter you're going to need a lot more else to be in your favour. So the main point to take from board texture is that it's very important but it doesn't determine whether or not you should see bet alone all it determines is how much help you need from the other factors. The second of which is equity or the first of the other factors is equity um, and it's the second thing we should consider and it's probably of equal importance if not slightly more importance in some cases to board texture. These are probably the two two most important ones that you can have. So it can be more crucial in some cases. On like really wet boards, you're just really looking for equity to see bet because you just don't think you're going to have enough fold equity and your opponent's going to have quite a easy time flopping enough equity to defend on the flop even if they aren't going to make it to the river. So you want a hand that's since it's going to be seen later streets quite often on these wetter boards, you want to be able to improve your hand and realize equity there more easily. You don't want to have like two outs. So what does equity mean, first of all? Well, the equity we're talking about here is non-made hand equity. We're not talking about equity in the form of like middle pair. That is equity technically, but I'm going to refer to that as showdown value and not equity. Take equity to mean chances to improve to a good hand that beats your opponent's flop calling range quite comfortably. So if you're, what should you assume your opponent's actually calling you with on the flop? Something like top pair, second pair, this is going to be the bulk, the sort of median, the median of his range, if you like, is going to be these kind of hands. It's not going to be like, he might have the nut sometimes or set, he might have a float sometimes, but these are not the median of his range. These are like the extremities of it. So play against the median, play against like that middle hand in his range when he calls flop. And that's usually going to be like a weakish top pair or something like that. So what this means is that we, why do we need equity to see bet or why do we sometimes need equity to see bet? Because what we lack in RFE, remember required fold equity that we talked about on earlier podcasts in a pre-flop context and it's no different on the flop, when you, whenever you make a bet and you risk an amount to try to win an amount, you always have this notion of required fold equity. There's always a percentage that your opponent needs to fold for you to break even on that steal or that stab or that see bet that light you bet, depending on your bet size in relation to the pot. So if you bet half pot on the flop, you need 33% fold equity. However, this is um, alterable, and it's alterable based on the amount of pot equity you actually have in the hand. So where hero has actually flopped something good um, that can improve, like a flush draw that has like 9 outs or 10 outs or, or whatever, um, hero, I don't know how you can have 10 outs actually, that's kind of weird, but yeah, usually you're going to have 9 outs with a flush draw. Um, you're going to be in a position where that RFE target on the flop, the amount of fold equity you require is diminished almost to zero. Basically, when you have a big nut flush draw, you just don't need any fold equity. Even if your opponent was never folding the flop, it would still be plus EV to see bet. And it may still be the best line if you if you think that you need to build this pot for implied odds reasons in future or something. So you don't need to have any... Um, sometimes you don't need any fold equity at all when your equity is substantial. But more often... What's going to be the case is that you flop a weaker draw, like you flop a gut shot more than you flop a flush draw, so it's easier to flop a gutter than it is a flush draw. When you have a gutter, you only have four outs to improve, and there you're only going to be able to decrease your RFE target by like 5 to 10%, probably not even that much, like 5% or so. And so in these cases, still having a gutter or having two overcards or having a backdoor flush draw, these things can swing what's otherwise quite a close spot into an obvious C-bet. If it's close board texture wise, like the board is like fairly wet but not soaking, um, there's a big difference between having an under pair there and having like two outs to improve, which is really, really bad, or having a gut shot and an overcard, which is going to give you seven outs to improve, which is really good, or it's at least three and a half times better than the under pair. It's, it's much better, basically. So, yeah, equity is really important. We're talking about non made hand equity, we're talking about outs. The more outs you have, the less favorable you need the board texture and the next few factors to be. So let's move on to another factor now. And we're going to talk about player type. So player type is important because some villains are just notorious for not folding, or villain types, I should say, are notorious for never wanting to fold the flop. We all, we've all played against that maniac that runs 65-40 and just min raises every single time we see bet. Against him, 
it would be really silly to make, you know, C bets on wetter textures with poor equity because we're just not going to get folds. So again, player type can swing things. It's less influential than the other two factors. You know, you will get maniacs that still fold on king 6-6, six, six, but you'll get maniacs that almost never fold on jack 10-9 because they just hit a gut shot of better, like, too often. So that said, though, you could get, like, a, a tighter player who is willing to fold the bottom of his range on jack 10-9, and so when you've got decent equity, you should still see better. Um... Or even when you've got small amounts of equity, you might still want to see bet there if you have fold equity. So player type makes a big difference. Who are the player types that fold to see bets? Well, generally tight regs who are just in line that play like 18, 15 and just play a fitter fold game that have low one win soft flop stats and low raised see bet stats and high fold to see bet stats. Um, you're looking for fitter fold fish. So guys, that if a guy limp folds pre flop, that's a really good sort of omen that he's of the fitter fold variety. Like he doesn't even want to see the flop for the price you've charged him that four big blinds or whatever. Remember last time we talked about isolating. I told you that anecdote about the guy that folded ace king after limping under the gun um, at a live game that I played in the states. Well, these kind of things happen online too. If you see someone fold pre flop to an iso after limping, they're probably gonna be a fitter fold fish. If you see a guy with stats like forty eleven or 34, 12 or something, just like passive kind of tame, wide but tame passive fish stats. These players are more likely to be just fit or fold on the flop and just trying to flop something. Oh, I didn't get there. I just give up now. These are the kind of guys you want to see bet. Lots against. These are the kind of guys you want to not just go completely insane and see bet anything, but definitely lessen considerably your requirements for the first two factors, board texture and equity. Need to be less in your favor when you've got a favorable player type who's going to fold a lot. Um... Players who are not going to fold much would be an aggro reg with a high one win soft flop, high went to showdown stat, and one of these red lining regs that just likes to bluff raise a lot and put a lot of pressure on people. Um, aggro fish, stationary fish, guys that run like 84, 14, these guys are usually just so stationary that they just can't bring themselves to fold any piece of the board. That said, they will be playing a very wide range. Um, aggro fish that run like 48, 34, or 65, 51, these guys are going to make your life difficult when you don't have a lot of equity. So definitely favor having equity and value betting the flop and don't make too many light C bets on bad textures with no equity against those players. I don't make any of those kind of C bets. They're just gonna leak a lot of money. Remember, it's not your right to win the pot just because you're the pre-flop raiser. There's absolutely no reason to think that you're entitled to the pot. Don't be one of these stubborn, idiotic regs that just like bets away, just C bets away all their money for no reason when they know that their opponent's gonna be raising or calling them a lot on whatever texture. Um, just because the board is like ace king four doesn't mean that he doesn't have a pair of aces or kings a lot and it also doesn't mean that you are, are entitled to win this pot people give me some really awful arguments for c-betting sometimes such as i continue here sometimes i ask someone why they see bet and they say to keep the aggression up or to keep up the betting lead and this isn't a reason this is just stating what they're doing in different words you know it's like me saying why did you just punch me in the face and you replying so i could hit you in the face that's just not really a very good justification because my question of why did you hit me kind of implies I don't, that's not going to be a good enough response just to reiterate what you did as you can't really say X because X doesn't really work. So don't say that you see bet to keep up the betting lead. You see bet, you are keeping up the betting lead when you see bet, but that's not why you're doing it. You're just stating what you did again. Um, you need to have a reason such as the board texture is dry enough and I have a gut shot or I don't need any equity here, it's so dry or I have so much equity I don't care about the board texture or villain so fit or fold that it doesn't matter that I don't have much equity and the board's fairly wet. You want to be putting all these factors together and thinking about why, not just saying, oh, I keep the pressure on, I put villain to the test, I keep up the betting lead. These are just nonsense phrases that need to be exterminated from the poker world. Old poker commentary. Like, man, if you go back to... 2004, 2005, 2006, let's say, I used to watch like this poker show, like Late Night Poker with an ex-girlfriend way back in the day in my student dorm, and you had Jesse May as the commentator, who's hilarious and a really nice guy, it seems, but didn't really know very much about poker. He'd always have a pro one that he would ask about it and stuff, but he'd always say things like, very standard C-bet here, he has to keep up that betting lead, he cannot show weakness, it's not an option, and it's just this kind of terrible old school thought process that's not logical and is not central to Evie, and when my students show me that thought process, I just like to beat it out of them as quickly as possible, and get them thinking about these factors that are central to Evie. That's why we're thinking about these factors today, they're very linked to the expected value of our play, and after all, we all want to make money, we care about Evie, that's what matters, so just be aware of these red herring kind of factors. Another thing, another fallacy, just while I'm on the topic of fallacies, is the fish flop fallacy, as I call it. 
And this is the belief that an opponent who plays a very wide range of hands preflop frequently connects well with low flops because their preflop range contains a lot of low cards other players would never play. So people will say something like, oh, this 8-4 deuce board is all over this guy's range like a rash. No. Just plain wrong. Completely wrong. If someone is playing a lot of hands that unpaired cards that are offsuit and contain deuces, fours, and eights, they're also playing a lot of unpaired cards, hands that contain nines, threes, sevens, sixes, fives, tens, jacks, queens, kings, aces. And all of those hands, when they don't contain the eight, the four, the deuce, or whatever I just said, are going to just miss the flop completely. So whenever someone has a higher concentration of weird two pair hands and one pair hands, they also have an even higher concentration of air. So please don't be one of these guys that uses the reason, oh, I didn't see about the four deuce deuce board because he probably has lots of twos. I mean, come on, what else does he have? It's not important how many deuce x he has in his range. What's important is how many deuce x he has relative to the rest of his range that's not deuce x. That's 2x, by the way, deuce x. That sounds like a bit of a weird expression, but that's what I mean. A two and another card. Anyway, so... That's those three factors, um, equity, board texture, player type, probably the most important three. Um, let's scroll down now in the old book to the fourth factor that I want to talk about. And this is one that causes an absolute ton of confusion. This factor just drives people crazy. They don't understand it properly. They misapply it all the time and they make big mistakes because of it. This is like one of the least well understood concepts for a poker player. Um, I would say a, a sort of novice to sort of semi-experienced poker player who's been playing for like a year or something, they will be quite advanced in some aspects of the game and just have a terrible understanding of this factor, showdown value, and what it actually means. I call it SDV throughout my book, showdown value, that's the acronym I'm going to use. This term is not, we're not talking about the nuts when we talk about showdown value. Sometimes people say, oh, I have a set, so I have showdown value, and it's like, yes, that's technically, you know, that's technically true, like you, you do, but it's like that's kind of like saying, well, I have a million pounds, therefore I can afford a packet of crisps. Um, yeah, you can, but there's more important things about a million pounds. There's more important things about a set. It's very strong. It's not what we mean. When we say showdown value, we're more talking about only having a few pounds to our name. We're talking about being able to win at showdown, being able to buy a pack of crisps, but not being able to buy like a house. Um, our hand is not good enough to value bet and win a big pot. It's just a hand that can win at showdown sometimes and beats air, basically. That's what we're talking about. And there's different extents of showdown value. You can have a lot, you can have a little, um, you can have a mediocre amount. But in general, showdown value is split into four or three different, or I should say two different types, but there are four different strengths of made or non-made hand that you can flop, but they, the only two of them would fall into the showdown value band. Let me explain what I actually mean by that. So on the left-hand side, we have no showdown value. That would be a hand that usually will not win at showdown unimproved, or uh, very rarely will win at showdown unimproved, like when you flop jack high or king high or even ace high on a wet board of like eight, seven, six. This is just bad showdown value. It's not even showdown value, to be honest. It's just air, basically. When you have no showdown value, that's actually a reason for light C betting. It's not the case that the other factors we looked at there, the more equity we have, the more we want to C bet, the more favorable the board texture, the more we want to C bet, the more villain folds, the more we want to C bet. But with this one, the more showdown value we have, the less we want to see bet because showdown value is a way of winning anyway. And what it does is it relieves our burden to actually extract fold equity and win the pot that way. We can actually win the pot blue line wise by just going to showdown and not red line wise by making our opponent fold. However, there are some times that you do want to bet when you have showdown value on the flop as a light see bet. That's a see bet without a made hand, a strong made hand, remember. And that is when you have vulnerable showdown value, which is the second part of the showdown value spectrum. Vulnerable showdown value is a hand that can win at showdown, but often becomes very much, very weaker. Um, becomes a lot weaker, I should say, against your opponent's range. My English just sounds like, sounds really terrible today, for whatever reason. Um, so vulnerable showdown value could be like ace-5 on queen-6-5. Like this hand is best a fair amount on the flop heads up, but you are not going to get to showdown and win with it anywhere near as often as it is a head on the flop, because your opponent's going to have six outs just in the form of two over cards to your pair almost all the time at minimum, maybe even more if he has like an any out draw or a 10 out draw or something like that. So you're looking for, with showdown value, um, you're looking to have 
your showdown value protected. You want to protect your showdown value when it's vulnerable. And if you think you've got a plus EV flop C bet because you'll get enough folds and your vulnerable showdown value, you're often advised to just bet that to take the pot down rather than trying to get the showdown with like a pair of fives or something like that. There's just too, too much equity available to your opponents, especially when you're multi-way, but still think you can see bet profitably for fold equity. The more the less vulnerable type of showdown value I refer to as stable showdown value, this is a hand that rarely gets weaker because there are not that many big cards over cards out to that hand. Like when you flop jack, a pair of jacks on like queen jack nine, you have like jack ten, you flopped an open end straight draw and a pair, your hand can just face it action on any turn. There are very few turn cards that are going to improve your opponent but not improve you. You're just looking at calling a bet very easily there. You're not worried about your opponent realizing equity with hands that he would have folded on the flop. And that's the key. Like when we say we want to protect our showdown value by betting the flop with it, we mean against hands that would be folding. If we bet and get called by a flush draw, that's not protecting our hand, that's just making a thin value bet against a flush draw. When we bet and our opponent folds two overcards to six out draw, that's protection gone well. Successful protection. A value hand is a hand that can get called by worse hands, so it's even stronger, and it doesn't fall into the realms of showdown value, even though it technically has showdown value. That's not what we're referring to when we say showdown value hands. And when you have a value hand, you obviously want to bet as well, but for different reasons, that's not a light C bet, that's a value C bet. So when your showdown value is stable, you should be more inclined to check the flop, bluff catch, play pot control, and don't worry about, about protecting it. When your showdown value is more vulnerable and there are more overcards available in particular, then you should be inclined to bet to make your opponent fold that equity that he's flopped but is not sufficient for him to continue with. When your opponent flops a six out draw against you in the form of two bad overcards, you would much rather win the pot right now than give him a free turn with those two bad overcards, unless he's going to bluff the turn like all the time with them or something. Okay, so that showdown value, that's like another very important factor. It's misapplied a lot. I'm going to finish up with the last factor here, um, which is, well, there are two other factors actually I'll, I'll zip through. First of all, multi-wayness is pretty straightforward. Um, not much to say about this other than the more people in the pot, the less your fold equity is going to be and the more inclined you should be to give up. Um, pretty straightforward. It, again, it goes hand in hand with all the other factors. And the example I give here is that, um, you know, let's say that we see a pretty dry flop of like Queen 85 Rainbow. Um, normally, heads up, we'd be very happy see betting this because we can expect to get a fold, you know, 50, 60% of the time easily. But if you see this flop four way, then each player only folds 50% of the time. We're going to be getting folds very infrequently indeed. Um, and so we should be checking that flop. Loads more examples in the book. Obviously, I'm skimming over this. The last factor I just want to touch on before I wrap up, it's been quite a long segment, is turn and river prospects. Now, this doesn't refer to like, are you going to flop a make a flush on the turn? Because we've already, already covered that in the form of equity. But what this means is, that do you have any backdoor draws on the flop? They're going to give you more turn cards that not only improve your equity, but allow you to barrel successfully, allow you to make plus EV turn barrels. Do they improve your equity plus your fold equity? That's what we're looking for. Are there turn cards that can be scare cards to your opponent's range? How many turns are favorable to bet? How many turns do we just have to give up on? On a board like Jack King King, when we bet the flop, there aren't that many turns here that we can actually bet to elicit more fold equity on. And if we have pocket sixes, there are like no turns that improve our equity apart from two sixes. So that's just a bad spot for Turner River Prospects. However, if we have a lower board, like 873 two-tone, we have like Jack-10. Okay, that's a gut shot. That's an immediate draw. But let's say we have like a backdoor draw. We just have like Queen-10 or something like that on 873. So we can turn a straight draw, but we can also hit our overcards and we can also just get overcard turns that improve our fold equity. We're may way more inclined to bet in that situation for sure. So... How many scare cards are likely to fall in the turn? Can our equity improve? Can our fold equity improve? This is a minor factor. It's not as important as the ones we just looked at, but it is still important. And that's the fifth and final factor for today. So just to summarize, when you're considering a light C-bet, that's a C-bet without a made hand for value, um, you're going to be thinking about flop texture. You'll be thinking about the equity you have to improve your hand. You'll be thinking about your opponent type and how often he folds. You'll be thinking about multi-wayness how multi-way you are, you'll be thinking about your showdown value, how much of that you have, is it stable, is it vulnerable, and you'll be thinking, lastly, about your turn and river prospects if the decision is close and you need to look at those. Like, sometimes a backdoor flush draw will swing it for you. Sometimes just knowing you have fold equity on ace and king turns because your opponent likes to put you on ace king gives you a reason to see about the flop if it's otherwise close. Okay, this has been Characters for Grinderschool.com.
um, not for grandschool.com, for Carrot Poker Podcast. I thought I was making a podcast for a different station there. Just say that every day. You know, I'm always making videos for Grinder School, which is a good site. Check it out, by the way. Um, for lower micro stakes players, I've got over 200 videos on there. But yeah, check out my website, carrotcorner.com. That's my own personal site where you can find these podcasts and lots of other content. And email me at admin at carrotcorner.com if you want to get in touch to hire me as your coach. I'd be happy to work with you guys on your game and hear from you guys just in terms of feedback, general things you want to see in the podcast or whatnot. So yeah, see you in the near future, hear from you soon and stay tuned for more of these episodes following my book um, in the near future.